All right, I'd like to call the meeting to order for the October 9th. Oops, sorry, 23rd. <laughs> Oops, sorry, you, you, you wrote that. Uh, 23rd <clears throat> meeting of the study session for Madam Clerk. Roll call, please. The record will reflect that Mayor Pro Tem O'Neill has an excused absence. All right, now we're going to have public comments on agenda and non-agenda items. Anyone wish to come forward, please do. <clears throat> Mayor Duffield, members of the council, my name is Jim Mosher. <clears throat> um, since many of you have an interest in the harbor, I thought you might be interested to know the reason I may sound a little tired is I spent more than four hours today over in the other city hall building attending unpublicized hearings about harbor issues. These two hearings were generated by the Harbor Commission's decision last month to revoke two mooring permits, one an onshore, one an offshore mooring, and as part of the new city crackdown on things that don't quite look right in our harbor. The Harbor Commission had revoked these last month. I'm bringing this to you today because the hearing officer said this concern should be expressed to you rather than the hearing officer. I think the hearings that took place today should not have taken place <clears throat> because our Harbor Code is very clear that whenever the Harbor Commission makes a decision, that decision is supposed to come to you for appeal either directly by the appeal of a citizen or by a call for review. <clears throat> At least one of the people this afternoon attempted to have their mooring revocation brought to you for a hearing here, an appeal hearing. They were apparently refused and they were told that the proper avenue is to go to a private meeting with a hearing officer. <clears throat> The city based this on an obscure part of the Harbor Code that was put in place in 2013 as part of the contentious decision to increase the rents that are charged for docks and moorings in the harbor. As part of the settlement of that matter, the, the, the new fees were to be based on a complicated uh, calculation based on the square foot, square footage of the piers and amount of water used, which people might dispute. So to make the change less painful, the council in January 2013, one of their first official meetings in this building, in, enacted a new procedure that those disputes could be resolved by a hearing officer. Your city staff is now, I believe, misapplying that to other decisions made by the Harbor Commission. And since my time is about up, I will just suggest you either should instruct the staff on what you want the procedure to be, because if you're gonna have calls for review, you certainly need to be able to have that, or else you need to clarify the code so that they will understand what the intention was. It was not that the Harbor Commission decisions should be supplanted by those of a, a hearing officer, one person substituting their judgment for seven. Thank you. Thank you, understood. Uh, <clears throat> we will look into that. Are there any other people who would like to speak on this matter? Carol, don't you wanna come up here? No, okay. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> so we have an interesting event here. Um, Mr. Harp, would you like to help me explain why this is happening, or should I just read So it? briefly, we're, uh, the mayor moved a consent calendar item up in the order in order to designate a city representative uh, as the labor negotiator to negotiate with the unrepresented employees in the key and management group. The key and management group consists of um, most of the management employees, including the city manager, city attorney, city clerk, and department directors. Um, and 
at this point we need somebody to be the designated representative this probably will change with whoever the mayor is on a going forward basis but for now um, we're recommend you know, it's recommended that um, mayor duffield fulfill those duties thank you for helping me with that um are there any council questions or comments i'll move approval all right we'll go out to public comments on this would anyone like to speak uh, Mayor Duffield, members of the council, uh, again, mean, meaning no disrespect to, to Mayor Duffield, but as the city attorney said, this is only a recommendation. There's nothing in writing that says that the negotiator has to be the mayor. So I think you're being asked to make a decision which of the seven of you should be the negotiator. And it's not obvious to me that the mayor is the best negotiator out of the seven people, or that you would always want whoever is the mayor to be the negotiator. So. I would respectfully suggest that you, you have a wider choice than that. And if you have a tougher negotiator, it would be in the public's benefit to have the toughest negotiator negotiating these new contracts. Thank you. All right, thanks. <clears throat> any, other pe any other people seeing none? All right, um, I would agree with that. Does anyone want to uh, change my position here? Would someone? <laughs> you can pick anyone you like to be the negotiator. Um, so if someone Somebody else would like to be the raise negotiator. Hand and this is, uh, Mr. Mayor, point, just a point of clarification. This is more of a sacrificial lamb position than a warrior. So I definitely think we should have the mayor. Okay. <laughs> Everyone. So, so I'll move approval. I'll move approval of the mayor again. Second. Thanks a lot. All right. Is, okay. We've got a motion. Let's vote. Motion carries unanimously, 6-0. <clears throat> closed session, Mr. Hart. Uh, thank you, Mayor Duffield. City Council will adjourn to closed session to discuss items 4A through C, including meeting with labor negotiators, the city manager, Grace Leung, Assistant City Manager, Carol Jacobs, Human Resources Director, Barbara Salvini, and Peter Brown to discuss labor negotiations with those unions listed under agenda item number 4A. The council will also meet with labor negotiator Mayor Duffy Duffield regarding negotiations with the unrepresented employees in the key and management group. All the members of the key and management group, including the city manager, city attorney, city clerk, and HR director, will be recusing themselves from that item. The city council, uh, and the basis of that's a uh, potential um, personal financial effect of those negotiations. The City Council will also be meeting with legal counsel to discuss whether to initiate litigation in regards to two matters. And Council Member uh, Piotr and Mayor Duffield will be accusing themselves from one of those matters based on um, the, the potential to impact their personal finances. Thank you. All right, thank you. We are recessed until the 7 o'clock regular meeting. I'd like to call the meeting to order for the October 23rd regular meeting. Madam Clerk, roll call, please. The record will reflect that Mayor Pro Tem O'Neill has an excused absence. Thank you. Mr. Harp, is there a closed session report? Uh, thank you, Mayor Duffield. There is no closed session report this evening. Thank you. We'll now have the invocation by Mr. Piotr and a Pledge of Allegiance by Mr. Muldoon. You wouldn't mind bowing with me. Uh, 
I'll read a quote here from John Quincy Adams. The best guarantee against the abuse of power consists in the freedom, the purity, and the frequency of popular elections. God, we look to you as the elections are coming up. Give us wisdom as the electors to elect the people that you want in power. God, we ask that you give this body wisdom tonight in making their decisions, and we ask in Christ's name, amen. States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, <clears throat> Madam Clerk. The city provides a yellow sign-in card to assist in the preparation of the minutes. The completion of the card is not required in order to address the city council. If the optional sign-in card has been completed, it should be placed in the box provided at the podium. The City Council of Newport Beach welcomes and encourages community participation. Public comments are generally limited to three minutes per person to allow everyone to speak. Written comments are encouraged as well. The City Council has a discretion to extend or shorten the time limit on agenda or non-agenda items. As a courtesy, please turn cell phones off or set them in the silent mode. Thank you. We will now have City Council announcements and new items Council members would like to be introduced for future agendas. And I'm going to merge it with oral reports from City Council on committee activities. All right, so here we go. Mr. Avery? I have none. Mr. Piotr? Mrs. Dixon. Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor. I have a couple of, of announcements. Um, two weeks ago tomorrow, I guess it was October 10th, I, I announced on October 9th, two weeks ago, <coughs> about the launch of our Clever Buoy project off the Balboa Pier. And I'm pleased to announce, just a second, uh, something caught my throat. Uh, that we did have this uh, announcement and a media event, if you will, and we had at least local, if not national, news media attention. And I don't know if a slide is coming up here. Just a reminder to all of you, because this is going on, the trial is a 60-day trial. It started two weeks ago. And that what is shown in yellow is literally a digital or virtual net that can identify any living animal that will swim in that space, and it will identify specifically a shark. So. Uh, not that we want to see a shark, but we, if it does work, we want to see it identified in a, in a sonogram that would be evident to our lifeguards in an immediate emergency response situation. So uh, it's going to be an, in, it is an interesting experiment. It's ongoing right now. It will end in 60 days. This is at no cost to the city. It's a private company from Australia that has developed this proprietary software technology that identifies sharks, not seals, not walruses, not dolphins, just sharks, because that's really what is the key and the economic implications of having sharks attack our swimmers is, as, as well as the tragic implications would be uh, very, very unfortunate for our community. In any event, what we're doing now is monitoring this, and the lifeguards are working uh, on, on identifying the movement out there. But most importantly, we're looking, and I'm speaking about, we're looking for federal, state, and local funds to help fund this, uh, because the city of Newport Beach has not expended any funds. This is a pilot at no cost to the city, but in 60 days it will run out. And so we've spoken with our congressman. We had Congressman mem member uh, mem uh, Rohrbacher, uh, Assemblyman Matt Harper, it's created a lot of visibility, a lot of national awareness because there have been shark attacks and fatal shark attacks in other parts of the country. So this could really be breakthrough technology and we're doing it here in Newport Beach. A lot of attention, but we do need the money to, to sustain this. We'd like it to operate for uh, at least through the summer. Uh, then similarly, down at the beach today, the best school in the country to go to school is Newport Elementary. As you all know, it's in the prime location. And I'll let the mayor speak to it as well. But we, this is an example of a public-public-private partnership. And many of you may remember over the last couple of years, many, several years, there's been a, an effort led by parents to uh, do the kind of the heavy lifting to get the design work done, actually put this through and apply through a coastal development permit through the Coastal Commission. The city has funded the re renovation of this playing field this beautiful natural grass playing field. 
and 50-50 with the school district. So we had a combination <coughs> event with the school board and members, uh, other council members, and the mayor was there and will speak to it. But I'll speak to the public-public-private partnership. So it's not only the city of Newport Beach, the Newport Unified School District, but it would, this whole effort was initially led by a group of parents, Matt Wiley, Eric Folsang, Mike Voorhees, Dina Behrens, Andy and Robin West, Shelley Walsh, and I said to many of them today out there at the park, at the field, that this is where tenacity counts. <laughs> when their children were in elementary school at Newport Elementary seven or eight years ago, <coughs> they're now in college, but we finally have their beautiful playing field, so thank you to Public Works, thank you to the school district, thank you to our council members who approved this project, and I think the school children, as you can see, they're playing on the field and it will, will be tied into after school playing activities, program activities that our uh, Recreation and Senior Services Department will be doing 12 months out of the year. So it's really a new park that has been improved in the city of Newport Beach. So, Mayor, it's all yours. Great, great job, thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Herdman. Yeah, can you leave that slide up, Dave, for a second? I was back in my element today. Down here in the corner, right down the corner. <clears throat> Those are little first graders that I went and surrounded myself with, had a great conversation with them. You'd thought, you would think that they had never seen grass before. They were so excited about this playground opening. And uh, what a, what a, uh, it was a great experience today. I, I think the thing that impressed me the most was, uh, not only the finished product, but how excited staff was about this and, and uh, how excited school board was about this too, where we, had, we had truly had a project that we collaborated on for the benefit of kids. So uh, real pleased to participate in that today. Uh, Mayor, how do you wanna handle the, uh, you wanna come back to this? No, go for it. Okay, uh, I, I would like to request that um, <clears throat> the council's consideration of um, putting a, a future agenda item on uh, having to do with the Arts Commission and the funding of Phase 4 for the center, Civic Center Sculpture Garden. Um, th th this is just a little tweak, uh, like a $19,000 tweak that I would like uh, the council to consider at our next meeting uh, so that the uh, s s plans for the Sculpture Garden All can right. move forward. All right. Go ahead and and just real quick, my recommendation would be uh, before you actually take a vote on that to see if there's uh, three people that support bringing that back right. to finish right. up with the council announcements and reports on council committee activities, and then we can take public comment, then actually okay. vote on that. Fine. Okay. <clears throat> All right, <clears throat> Mr. Muldoon. Uh, first, I'll do the future item before I make announcements. I'm hoping to hear from uh, Dennis Durgin on all of his amazing accomplishments here in the harbor and honor him for his service to the city of Newport Beach, perhaps the next council meeting. And I have an exciting announcement. <laughs> we could put it up. Yeah. So, uh, Heather and I are very proud to announce our first son, first baby, Cannon Thompson Muldoon, was born October 9th at 9 p.m. I should have been in a council meeting and I had the best reason in the world to, to miss it. Um, I named him, it's a family name, but I also hope he, he becomes a quarterback. So hence the name Cannon. And uh, I appreciate all the emails and text messages I've got from people in the community, many of whom are here tonight, for your concerns, your support. He was three weeks early. He looks like his mom. Yeah, he does. <laughs> he does look like Heather, as Jeff noted. He's prettier than me. Uh, and uh, I appreciate all the support. And um, Look forward to uh, you all meeting him uh, once he gets his shots. Thank you. <laughs> all right, that's a good job. Best job you ever did. <clears throat> all right. We have a slide on this flu shot clinic. All right. So, <clears throat> if you haven't gotten your flu shot yet, you can get one for free at the Oasis Center on Wednesday, October 24th from 9 to 11, that's tomorrow. Hogue Hospital's Department of Community Benefits is sponsoring the free flu clinic for anyone aged 18 and above. The, vet, the, vet, 
are available, the vacancies, <laughs> what are they? are available on a first come, first served basis. Oasis is located at 801 Narcissist Avenue in Crow Del Mar. Now we have another slide. The Halloween Spooktacular. All right, the third annual Halloween Spooktacular is on Saturday, October 27th from 4 to 7 p.m. Children can fill their goodie bags with, while walking through the trunk or treat area or explore the haunted maze if you dare. There will be costume prizes, bounce houses, carnival games, food trucks, and more. The Halloween Spooktacular takes place on, at Grant Howard Park in Corona Del Mar. This family-friendly friendly event is free and open to the public. <coughs> um, and also, I would like to chime in on this um, wonderful Newport L grass. And I have to say, I'm, I don't think I've ever stepped on grass that that spectacular and thick and juicy and full. It was like a carpet. And um, I have been fortunate enough to play on the um, Coliseum uh, grass. and. I think it's equal to and or better than that. And that was the best grass I've ever been on. Um, the one thing that really sets this off differently is the engineering of a, of a solution that seemed to be insurmountable. Because uh, as we get these clearing westerlies after a storm, the sand and the 20 knot winds uh, coming from the west blow all this, all this sand onto the grass and it kills the grass. So. Uh, the uh, public works group and our engineers were able to um, overcome the policies of the Coastal Commission, which, is, which isn't easy, and engineer a, a wall that will um, deter and, and um, lessen the impact of this um, sand that keeps ruining for the last four or five decades all the grass that's there. So I, I applaud you guys for sticking with it and getting that done. And, and that really is the element that will keep that, that grass there. So we're very proud that you came up with a thought outside the box and figured it out. So I'm proud of that. <coughs> All right, now we'll go to um, public comments on the city announcements and all this we just went over. Does anyone like to come up and speak on that? And just for clarification, we've combined council announcements, reports on council committee activities, and matters which council members have asked to be placed on a future agenda. So if you want to comment on any of those things, now is the time. Uh, thank you, Mayor Duffield, members of the council. <clears throat> uh, perhaps because the chair of that committee is not here, uh, I don't believe we heard a report on the doings of the finance committee, which met since your last uh, meeting here, <clears throat> and I also would be curious if any of you who serve on outside committees had meetings between the last meeting of the council and this meeting, because I did not <clears throat> hear any reports on those committee activities if they took place. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to come up? Thank you for allowing us to make comments, Mayor Duffy. Um, I'm here to speak in regards to Dennis Durgan's forced resignation as Harbor Master. Um, I personally believe that it's in very poor taste to find that politics have seeped into making decisions that so negatively impact the city's well-being. Um, I, again, personally believe that there's no person single-handedly more qualified to be harbor master than Dennis Durgan, given the number of hours he spent in the harbor. Um, and to, be, to find out by um, at the recruitment company, which I believe is located 50 miles north of Sacramento, that he is uh, being relieved of his position and then being forced to resign, um, again, I think just speaks very poorly of some of the decisions that are being made um, that are clearly being affected by politics. Um, and so for that reason, you know, to be told that you're not qualified from a position, despite the fact that you probably have more time 
um, doing that job than anyone else because you don't have a bachelor's degree, I think is, is again, um, I think it just reflects on how decisions are being made. And I think that's um, not the correct way of doing things here. Um, it's good that you've asked them to come back as consultants. Um, I think you'll be able to find that that will be helpful in getting things moved in the right direction, which is what he was doing and really finding out what was wrong. I mean, I know firsthand the number of hours that he spent um, as Harbor Master trying to understand how things work and trying to improve the situation. And I think anyone who knows Dennis knows how correctly he goes about doing everything. I mean, he's probably the most calm, sensible person I've ever met in my life. So again, I think that that is something very important to take into consideration a person's demeanor um, an experience that they bring to the job um, by uh, everything that they've done and really having some respect and not telling them and forcing them to resign. Um, again, I just, I think that it's in very poor taste to allow politics to seep into, into making decisions that ultimately will affect the city poorly and the Newport Beach Harbor very poorly. And I urge you to reconsider that, um, the, the, the true effect of that decision. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Are there any others that would like to come up? Please come up. Thank you, Mayor Duffield and City Councilman. I also am here for the same reason. I went to a luncheon last week honoring Dennis Durgan at the new Newport Harbor Yacht Club. So the first public event that they're having there was to honor Dennis Durgan. And to sit there next to Dennis and to see an e that he was told by an email that he was not gonna be considered for the harbor master job that he was appointed and has, and has worked very hard. And I've known Dennis a long time. He's, a, he's just like Cornelia said, he works very, very hard and he cares more than any person. And I basically said, why don't they have a Jeopardy type show and, and they have all the applicants sit down with Dennis and ask questions and I will bet you that Dennis will know more answers about the harbor than any person that, that has applied for this job. So basically I'm just asking you to reconsider at least interviewing Dennis for the job. And when you think about it, Bill Gates didn't graduate from college either. So I would say pick the most qualified person who cares the most about this city and the harbor and have him be harbor master. Thank you. All right, thank you. Anyone else? Good evening, Mayor Duffield and council members. My name is Barbara Daly, and I am with the Transportation Corridor Agencies, also known as the Toll Roads. We're, so we were, go ahead. Oh, just briefly, we're, we're only uh, discussing council announcements, reports on council committee activities, or matters which council members have asked to be placed on a future agenda. I so, apologize. Yeah, so it'll be just a minute. Okay, okay no problem. Thanks. Sorry about that. Anyone else want to speak about? The items we were talking all right seeing none I'll bring it back and um, any discussion up here I see none I'd like to go ahead and then ask for a vote on the um, item that <coughs> mr. Herdman brought up consideration of requests from the Arts Commission related to the funding of phase four of the Civic Center sculpture garden Yeah, just do one at a time. Okay. Ready? Two. Show of hands. Okay. Vote yeah. unanimous. Yes. All right. And now, Mr. Muldoon. To honor. To, all right. To honor Dennis Durgan in the future. Actually, that one's that one's not on the agenda okay. for tonight for the, 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 the vote. Yeah. That comes as an A1 item. All right. Do I need to go back to public comments on this? On consent calendar. 
items. On the consent calendar. This is the time in which council members may pull items from the consent calendar for discussion. Those are items one through 10. Public comments are also invited on consent calendar. Speakers must limit comments to three minutes. Before speaking, please state your name for the record. If any item is removed from the consent calendar by a council member, members of the public are invited to speak on each item for up to three minutes per item. All matters listed under consent calendar are con considered to be routine and will all be enacted by one motion in the form listed below. Council members have received detailed staff reports on each of the items recommending action. There will be no separate discussion of these items prior to the time the City Council votes on the motion unless members of the City Council request specific items to be discussed and are removed from the consent calendar for separate action. All right, thank you. All right, I'm going to ask uh, Councilman Muldoon to be our Mayor Pro Tem for this motion, but I will go ahead now and ask if uh, the Council if there are any items to pull from the consent calendar. Mr. Avery. I have none. Mr. Piotr. I want to note a recusal for number one because I wasn't here and for items three and four because I did not hear the public testimony on those two items. All right. Mrs. Dixon. No items. Thank you. Mr. Herdman. Just clarification on item number three. Uh, this will be the first reading. Correct? No. Which one are we? Uh... So three and four, this will be second reading. There is another... Or under public hearing um, number item 11 under public hearing is the uh, uh, okay thank that you that one will be the first sorry yes. mayor pro tem Muldoon uh, I will uh, be voting no on item 10 and uh, nothing to pull right thank you and I will be recusing myself on items 3 and 4 due to business conflicts Thank you. So we have a, uh, I'll make a motion <clears throat> to approve items one through 10 with a recusal from Council on Piotr and item one and recusals from Mayor Duffield and Council on Piotr and items three and four. Second. Oh. And a no intent for myself, yes. I second. All right, we'll now go to public comments. Would anyone like to come up and speak? on the consent calendar items. Public comments. Sorry, she came again, sorry. almost. Sorry. I am walking in a little bit late, but it looks like number three is a um, something to do with a harbor. And we come back to the question um, regarding Mr. Piotr and um, voting on issues having to do with har the harbor because he is employed. Mr. Piotr's recused himself from that item. From number three? And four. Oh, I'm sorry, I totally missed that. Right. Take that back. Anyone else? Please come up. <clears throat> Mayor Duffield, members of the council, my name is Jim Mosier. I have several comments <clears throat> on the consent calendar and uh, because of the limited time I'm gonna give them in the reverse order in case I run out of time. Uh, for first comment I want to make is about item 10, the cultural arts grants. I was not quite aware of this at the time the Arts Commission was uh, considering this, uh, but I have to question why we're giving another $5,000 to the Newport Beach Film Festival when we're already giving them $150,000, and especially when they're giving back tickets to the Arts Commissioners of almost as much value as the grant. I think that it would be more proper if the city just paid for tickets for the arts commissioners to attend it. That would give them the revenue uh, rather than the very bad optics of giving a grant and then getting it back in tickets. <clears throat> Second item I want to comment on is item five, the summary vacation of a sewer easement on King's Road. Uh, this, this is of concern because there was no notice to the neighbors that you were gonna be considering this. And the sewer easement is kind of down the bluff uh, next to a public park. Uh, and the staff report said that the giving up of the easement was wanted in connection with the construction project. Uh, that This is concerning if the, <clears throat> the residential construction project is to build out over the bluff possibly blocking the views from the public park, which is supposed to be protected uh, by our general plan. And so that I do not run out of time, 
<clears throat> I will say nothing further about that, but I do want to comment on number four, which is the uh, amendment to uh, Municipal Code Title 17, the Harbor Code. So if Mr. Duffield is not allowed to listen to this, cover your ears, I guess. <clears throat> this, this afternoon, I cautioned you about taking care to enact laws that are say what we want them to say. Yes. Yeah, technically they could, you know, because it's on consent calendar, Mr. Duffield and um, Mr. <clears throat> can stay, but they probably should step out of uh, step out if you're going to talk about numbers three and four. Yes, my time is ticking away. We'll give you an extra 10 seconds, Jim. How about that? Yes, I, I mentioned this afternoon that the intention of the Harbor Code has always been <coughs> that decisions at the Harbor Commission can be, be appealed to, the, to you, the City Council. In 2013, the City Council added a clause that allowed a hearing officer to, to medi mediate disputes about permit fees in the harbor. That has been misunderstood by our city staff as preempting the right of people to have a harbor commission decision heard by you. But this item number four was amended on the fly at your last meeting, and I'm looking at page 4-5 of the staff report. I thought from what I heard, orally at the last meeting that had been corrected properly, but section 1765.010 of the Harbor Code is where the provision was that gave citizens the right to appeal Harbor Commission decisions to the City Council. If you look at page 4-5, section A of that said that the Harbor Master, any interested person could appeal a decision of the Harbor Master to the Harbor Commission. There currently is a provision B that says any interested person can appeal a Harbor Commission decision to the City Council. Uh, the, the language that you are being asked to enact here in the second reading, if you adopt it, is obliterating that provision. Provision B is, there I were think four, that's your 10 now seconds, three. <laughs> All right, thanks. Okay. Yeah, I think you're done talking, your time's up. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Skinner, I think you've already spoken on this item. I was gonna talk on five. But you, you get one chance to talk on all the consent items. I believe you've already spoken, haven't you? I mean, it's okay. not my decision to make, but. All right, if you wish me not to, if you wish me not to speak, Aaron, I will not speak. You've already spoken, no, actually. <laughs> Hi, my name is Dorothy Krause, and I'll speak on item five. Summary vacation existing sewer easement at 1721 Kings Road. Um, the opening sentence of the discuss discussion says that the vacation of this particular city sewer easement is to accommodate a home construction project, yet the uh, parcel, the homeowner, has not submitted a permit to build this home. This looks like the cart before the horse to me. I'm very concerned what's the urgency around allowing this easement to this person that hasn't even submitted a development application to develop the cr and construct this home. Um, this is a, a, this at first glance to me is a piecemeal approach to getting through the development process. What can we expect next? Another exception to setbacks, an exception to floor area limits. Very, very concerning. I don't think this should be done. Let's wait to see what this person wants to build and then talk about an easement. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Anyone else like to speak? On the, no, these are on uh, consent items. Yeah, thanks. Okay, I'll bring it back. Any com comments from the council? Mrs. Dixon? Um, yes, Ms. Krause had a good question. Uh, <laughs> can we get an answer to that? Well, I did not realize that there wasn't a current application, so. What is the timing issue here? Yes, uh, Mr. Dixon. Um, the, the issue tonight, and I have a slide on the screen that goes to item five just to give you some background. The applicant has asked us to vacate an, uh, an easement not being used on their property. Um, these, this is an easement, if you look on the slide here, and I'll point to it, the subject property is in red, and the dash line is the existing easement. There was an, an existing sewer in here that was banned long ago that ran along through the park and out. 
this uh, sewer is no longer active and he takes access now from this point right here and sewages through the adjacent neighbor's property. So he has, uh, as in other homeowners along this bluff, have asked to have this vacated, uh, it's easement vacated because it's not in use. Uh, we are looking for a summary vacation because it just affects this property owner. Some of the things I heard tonight have more to do with zoning and land use and setbacks and this easement's not tied to that. That would be a separate development application. All right, one other question. I think we received, we did receive a letter calling attention to the neighboring adjacent park. So what's the impact to the park? So the easement uh, vacation has no impact to the park. I think what the audience has referred to is that by vacating this easement, which again, there's not an active sewer in it, that would maybe as in their own minds pre-issue uh, the fact that they could build a larger house. But as I understand, and I'm, again, I might have some on Jurgis talk to that, but the zoning would dictate this house. The existing envelope of the house is defined by our setback rules, our um, boundaries that you can build a house in, and it's not related to the easement. The easement's just a vacated sewer right now. Okay, thank you. All right, any other comments up here? Seeing none, let's vote. Prior to reading the vote, I'll read the ordinance titles for Ordinance number 2018-17 and 2018-18, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Newport Beach amending Newport Beach Municipal Code titles 1 and 17 related to the Harbor Department and amending the Newport Beach Municipal Code title 17 pertaining to vessel speed limits. The motion carries unanimously 6-0. All right, thank you. Again, Madam Clerk. Public comments are invited on non-agenda items generally considered to be within the subject matter jurisdiction of the City Council. Speakers must limit comments to three minutes. Before speaking, please state your name for the record. Thank you. Are there any public comments on non-agenda items? Please come up. Thank you, Mr. Mayor Duffield, Honorable Council Members, and uh, congratulations, uh, Council Member Muldoon, on your new, new uh, family member. And you're growing family, so uh, it was good news. We missed you last time. So I'm just uh, here again. My name is Ryan Reza Farsai. I'm a nobody here in the uh, city of Newport Beach. I have a little cubicle. It's a condominium. Um, it's one of 54 condominiums in a half mile circle. I, I bought the condominium because it's a half mile circle. I was using the half mile circle to uh, practice with my road bike because I've done many of triathlons. I'm a uh, I was a varsity athlete as a freshman at USC, and then I uh, quit the team because I had another argument with my coach. I basically like to butt heads with people that like to push me around because I'm one of those people that is hard to push around. So the reason I'm here today, and I've been here for the last few weeks, is because my civil rights, my constitutional rights, and my property rights have been stolen. Now you should all know, members of the audience, that we as citizens, we really don't have any rights in America. It's just the way it's designed. By design, it's a design flaw, in my opinion. But what does have rights is properties. Why do properties have rights? Because this is King's game. It's all about properties and acquiring more properties and everything west of the Mississippi is now gonna be the government that's gonna dish it out to all their family members. So what I've been told for the last few years while I meditate and do yoga is I'm gonna be giving everyone in America <laughs> continuing education on the First Amendment. I don't really understand what that means. So I was like, okay, whatever that means, all right, let's, let's play this tune. So uh, fast forward several years later, and I'm here in front of you. Thanks be to God. I am a Trojan. I'm a phoenix rising. Unfortunately, people have gotten in my way, and they keep disrespecting me like I'm a little kid. I'm not a little kid. I've come a long ways. I've traveled to over 70 countries before I was 35, 60 before I was 30. I'm a million miler before I was even 25. So what is that? It gives me the privilege of knowing that I really appreciate my lifestyle here in California. Unfortunately, from 1915 to 1970, about 8 million Americans had to move out of the South to be called Americans. I had to do the same thing here in California. I had to get an Oregon driver's license to stay away from the state of Israel who's been mocking me and my community and the kings of Europe. I've written many letters to everyone in, that's important in this country. Thus far, no one's called me. So that's kind of disrespectful in my opinion. 
So it's about respect. You give respect to others, but they give respect to you. If they disrespect you, you have the right to disrespect them back. It's called the golden rule. I follow it. I shared with the police department. That's the way I operate. That's the way I operate, Chief Lewis. I'm a very straight up guy. John Wayne's brother, John Wooden's brother. I'm standing here in front of you. I told myself I'd be the king of Newport Beach. And how am I doing? All right, thank you. For the city, United States Constitution. All right, thanks. Uh, <coughs> next speaker, please. Good evening. My name is Susan Skinner, and I'm here this evening to address the potential conflict of interest muddle that Mr. Duffield and Mr. Piotr have gotten this city into. To recap, in August, I heard rumors that Mr. Duffield had hired Mr. Piotr and brought this up with him. Both men went to great lengths to evade the question. I ultimately filed a complaint with the FPPC, a complaint that despite Mr. Duffield's or statement to the press that, quote, the FPPC had ruled that there was no conflict of interest, is actually very much still an open investigation. Ultimately, we learned that Mr. Duffield had, in fact, hired Mr. Piotr to help him subdivide the Adelanto property where Duffield boats are built so that part of the property could be used for marijuana cultivation. Mr. Duffield claimed in an e email to the Daily Pilot that he only got a state cannabis license to increase the resale value of his property, but when I called the Bureau of Cannabis Control, I did not even know that we had a Bureau of Cannabis Control, but we do, they confirmed that such a license is not transferable, obviating that claim. It was not illegal for Mr. Duffield to hire Mr. Piotr, but in doing so, Mr. Duffield's financial interests became Mr. Piotr's financial interest, even if the Duffy Boat Factory is 100 miles away. State law appears crystal clear on this, and councilmen are given an ethics course when they take office to help them understand what their responsibilities are in this regard. Thus, the 11-page conflict of interest restrictions that limit Mr. Duffield from voting on issues regarding Newport Harbor now would seemingly apply to Mr. Piotr as well. It is this conflict of interest which leads Councilman Piotr and Duffield into serious violations of the law and creates a royal mess for the city of Newport Beach to now unwind. This business relationship has been going on since mid-2017. In that time, Scott Piotr has been Duffield's water bearer on multiple votes regarding harbor issues, including any number of contracts. Each of these contracts may well now be voided, leaving us with furious vendors and their lawyers to deal with, potentially at great cost to the taxpayers. Any administrative actions previously taken can just now be thrown out of the window and begun again. Conflict of interest laws exist for a reason, and the overt actions taken by Mr. Duffield and Mr. Piotr are yet another example of their disregard for the best interest of the residents and their inclination to put self above city. To those who are watching tonight, please take these facts into consideration when you mark your ballot. Our city has been plagued with ethical challenges since 2014 when Mr. Duffield, uh, Piotr, and Muldoon were elected and we will have an opportunity on November 6th to replace these councilmen it's with a council who values ethics and transparency. I can only campaign. hope that our next city council will include Joy Brenner, Tim Stokes, Roy Engelbreck, and Diane Dixon, and I will continue to work to ensure that these candidates are elected. Thank you. Thank you. Any other speakers? So, finally, sorry. My apologies. Good evening, council members, Mayor Duffield and council members. My name is Barbara Daly, and I am the Public Affairs Director for the Transportation Corridor Agencies, also known as the Toll Roads here in Orange County that represent 50% or 20% of Orange County's highway system. As a government agency, it is our responsibility to provide accurate and reliable information to the public and our city elected officials, um, which is what brings me to your council meeting this evening. As many of you may know, over three years ago, TCA embarked on a robust public engagement effort to seek broad input in advance of defining traffic relief solutions to be further studied in detail in a formal state and federal environmental review process. 
While we know that there will be differing views and we respect that, we are committed to providing a proactive and collaborative process to ensure public and stakeholder engagement. That being the case, I would like to submit to you this evening background information regarding our agency and our current efforts to address the ongoing traffic congestion on Interstate 5 in South Orange County. I would request that you receive this information and make it available to all interested parties, including city staff and your community. I've included my business card um, with this information and welcome the opportunity to address any questions, concerns, or requests you may have going forward. And with that, I thank you for receiving this information and for allowing me to speak this evening. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, seeing none, I'll bring it back. Mr. Mayor, just a quick comment on, on Ms. Daly's comments. I had asked her to, uh, to attend and give the presentation because we had that presentation from, uh, from some of the residents in the city of San Clemente about six weeks ago. I think it was our first September meeting. But thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, our first item, number 11. Item 11, minor ad amendments to the city's local coastal program. Staff have a report or would you like to, would the guys like to see or have a report? Okay, go for it, please. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm Simon Georges, I'm the Community Development Director. With me I have Patrick Alford. This evening is a, an item with regards to, it's an introduction of an ordinance for a minor amendment to our local coastal program. This is the second time we're presenting this item to you. We've presented to you before about a month ago, um, but at that time we had the wrong report from the Coastal Commission staff. So this is a redo of the item that we presented about a month ago. I'm gonna introduce Patrick Alford. He's our planning manager. He's gonna go through a, just a very brief uh, PowerPoint presentation. Yes, uh, this is to Title 21 of the Municipal Code, which is our implementation plan of our certified local coastal program. The changes based are in three categories. They are uh, post LCP submittal changes. These were uh, changes to the city code that were in the pipeline when we first submitted to the Coast Commission. It adds the Lido Villas Plan Community Development Regulations to the IP. It uh, includes the landscape maintenance exceptions during droughts that were adopted during that time period. We have a number of corrections and clarifications relating to appeals and calls for review. Uh, CDP waiver call-ups, CDP exemptions, these are just basically minor changes that uh, either has some internal inconsistencies or just uh, uh, some ambiguities that we want to correct. And then there is a, a new uh, section that will be added. This is a provision uh, that is allowed under the Coastal Act that will allow minor development to uh, receive a waiver from the public hearing requirement for a coastal development permit. So basically this new section would uh, limit to minor development, which is basically development that is consistent with the certified LCP, involves no other discretionary approvals, and has found no impact to coastal resources or public access. We will send out a public notice of this, of our intention to issue the CDP without the public hearing, and it's a 15-day working period in which people can respond. If we don't receive any request for a public hearing, then we, the city can go ahead and issue the coastal development permit. However, if a public hearing is requested, then we'll go through the normal process, re-notice and conduct a public hearing. That concludes my presentation. I'll be happy to answer any questions. All right, any, anyone up here like to comment? Mr. Herdman? Patrick, could you give uh, us some examples of what that, this might uh, be a project? Well, we haven't set a procedure. We consider this to be a tool in the toolbox that we could use when, uh, when appropriate. But just as an example, we are discussed internally and no decision has been made yet. We have, um, for example, in an upcoming zoning administrator hearing, two coastal development permits for mobile home, a mobile home park. Now, this uh, basically involves taking out one mobile home and putting in another one. Um, in this case, it's a planned community and our Category exclusion order, which normally would exempt a single family house, would not apply because it's in a planned community. And we also cannot grant a waiver for minor development because it is uh, in the appeal area. We can't uh, waive coastal development permit requirements even for small projects uh, when they're within the appeal area. So this would give us the ability to at least expedite these things if we have no objections from the neighboring uh, 
property owners or any interested person, then we just go ahead and issue the permit. Thank you. Mr. Avery. So is this essentially a like-for-like like sort of thing? I mean, what other, what other projects would, might Further examples. Yeah, yeah thank curious. you, Councilmember. I think I think to add to Patrick Alford's statement is um, a patio cover is a project that re would require a permit, and if it's in the coastal zone, typically you probably need to issue a coastal development permit. But that's a minor. It doesn't inhibit public access. It doesn't um, affect the our the local coastal act, um, and so something like that would still need a coastal development permit but just wouldn't require a public hearing. And so what we would do is actually notice the neighbors and say, do you have any issues with this? Because we're not gonna have a public hearing. If somebody responds to it and says, I have a concern, then we would take the next step and actually have a public hearing. Great, thank you. Oh, Mrs. Dixon. Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, Mr. Alfred, could you explain on the Lido Villas that we, I had noticed this before, but I hadn't seen it before, uh, until it was in the document this week, but short-term lodging, is that a discretionary action or is that mandated because it's a multi-unit facility? Or is it, tell me what puts it there? <laughs> well, th this is a straight residential project and the Coast Commission, I think, is one of their modifications that they wanted to uh, uh, basically allow that just as it would be in any other zoning district of that type. So um, it's just a clarification. The PC has its land use regulations, but it was silent on short-term lodging. The Coast Commission thought we should address it. Is that, so this would, because there are other multi-unit uh, structures in the city that don't have short-term lodging, or not eligible for short-term lodging permits, are there not? I believe that they are. All are? I don't know. I forget, actually. Typically, short-term lodging is allowed in the kind of multifamily um, properties, multifamily zones, in, in addition to um, the, uh, the R2s. All of them? Yes, correct. Okay, all right, all right, thank you. All right, seeing no other comments from up here, I'd like to take it out to the public. Would anyone in the public like to speak on this item? All right, seeing, oh, here we go, Mr. Uh, Mayor Duffield, members of the council, my name is Jim Mosier. <clears throat> As we heard, this, this is the request for you to ratify the city's requests as they were modified by the Coastal Commission <clears throat> at a hearing they heard in, uh, or held in Scotts Valley near Santa Cruz. <clears throat> and as you heard, this had a previous first reading, which was based on a, an incorrect copy of the modifications that had present, been approved in Scotts Valley, <clears throat> because you have to approve the same thing that they approved there for this to work. Um, and so you're redoing it with a new letter that you have from them. And as planning manager Alfred would admit the revised copy actually does not, again, quite reflect what happened at Scotts Valley. They, they actually sent to you the modifications that they proposed to adopt, kind of like a consent calendar item. And at that hearing, they made a minor, minor modification at the city's request to one of the last things here. It did not come through in this new letter that you have. So it's not precisely what they approved. I understand the city is not concerned about whether that request is processed or not, and hopefully they will agree this is close to what they approved at Scotts Valley. So like with that ordinance that you passed earlier, verbal changes to things that happen at meetings don't always get acted upon properly. <clears throat> and so that verbal promise of them to the city didn't come through. The city made a verbal promise to the Coastal Commission regarding this business about waivers of hearings. And that promise was that the city staff would make a special effort to let the citizens of Newport Beach know about this new waiver procedure and their ability for free to be notified of the city 
choosing to waive the hearing requirement. I hope that our city staff will honor that verbal commitment that they made at Scotts Valley to let the public know that they have the right to know when a waiver is taking place in case they might want to object to it. Thank you. All right, next speaker, thank you. Hi, Dorothy Krauss. Um, I had emailed with Patrick today and one of the questions I asked just to build on a little bit of what Jim was remarking on is are the suggested Coastal Commission staff modifications included in this latest amendment and just because it was late in the day I didn't get an answer but I am also concerned that things aren't clearly reconciled between what happened in the meeting and the suggested modifications and we can blame it on the Coastal Commission staff or whatever, but at the end of the day, it's important that the LCP is reconciled with, with what the agreements were, whether in writing or verbally, with the Coastal Commission staff. My other comment is that Council Member Herdman, I thought you had a great suggestion. T let's see some examples of when a waiver would be permitted because this awning on a mobile home or swapping out a mobile home, that those are examples, but I bet there are others, and I think the public would really benefit in some manner to know what maybe a laundry list is of when a CDP would be considered a minor development or wavered, and then I, would r I think the public would really appreciate examples, because otherwise we all start spinning and getting worried. The comment Jim made about the notification, um, how will we be noticed if um, a public hearing is wavered? Exactly how will that happen? How will we be noticed? What will be in the content of the notice? So these are just things that I think that once we turned over this whole CDP process to the city, for a few of us, maybe many of us, the red flags started to fly around about what was going to happen, and it's been a very fragmented process. Nobody's to blame. It's just the way it is. But again, examples, making sure everything that was agreed upon is in the final amendment, um, how, to be, how are we going to be noticed, I think will go a long way for our support, the public's support of this. Thank you. All right, thank you. Any other speakers? Bring it back. I don't see anyone up here. Um, Simone, would you, I'm sorry to put you on the spot. Can you maybe address briefly a couple of those items yeah. that they, thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I think Ms. Krauss uh, brings up a good point. With regards to the letter that we received from the Coastal Commission staff, this is the third iteration. Patrick has gone through it in, in, with a fine tooth comb in, in detail, and we're satisfied that it, it meets everything of our requirements. I think there's some words, nuances, where uh, coastal would use local government versus the actual the word city, um, but other than that, we're very happy with the letter that we received and that's presented to you this evening. With regards to examples of projects, I want to say maybe a room addition, a one-story room addition, is something where will require a coastal development permit, but maybe it's something that doesn't require a public hearing, and we have noticing provisions in Title Twenty One. We have to notice the neighbors. We have to notice uh, local government agencies like the school district um, and to see if anybody has any concerns or issues. So there are noticing provisions in our code that we have to follow. This is not a waiver of the coastal development permit. This is just a, a possible waiver of a public hearing. Um, we will notice properties around the project site and ask them that if do they have any concerns with this item. And if they don't speak up, we go ahead and issue the Coastal Development Permit. If they do speak up, we have a follow public hearing and, and then let that hearing take place and see if there's any issues that come about from that hearing process. I hope that answers the question, Mr. Mayor. Great, thank you, I hope it does. Um, Mr. Avery. Um, I understand you know, the concern. Um, it's just such a... Um, important item protecting the coast and um, our properties. So I think the real request is to uh, do some over communicating. And so I don't know if we could put together a fact sheet of what it is and maybe put it online and, and answer some of the questions and just sort of line it out and the process 
because I know everyone's heard it tonight, but going forward, uh, some people may forget certain things, but I think to the degree that we can launch this with a real clear set of facts of what it is and what it is and give some examples and just have it there uh, online or maybe include it with a mailing, I'm not sure, but that would be great. That's something we can, we can do easily. Thank you. All right, Mr. Avery, thank you. Good suggestion. All right, I don't see any other comments up here. Um, is there a motion? I'll move to support the minor amendments to the city's local coastal program. I'll second the motion. Thank you. All right. And just to confirm that's staff's entire recommendation. Yes. yes but. Let's vote. Prior to reading the vote, I'll read the ordinance title for ordinance number 2018-16, an ordinance of the City Council of New City of Newport Beach, amending title 21 of the Newport Beach Municipal Code to approve local coastal program amendment number LC 2016-002 as modified by the California Coastal Commission. The motion carries unanimously, 6-0. Great, all right, thank you. Item 12. Uh, prior to before you start, Mayor, I have to recuse myself because I live near one of the facilities. Okay, thank you. Item 12, annual review of zoning implementation for sober living by the sea. Do you want a report? No, thank you. Oh, thank you. No report? Oh, can I just make a comment? If I, or are you gonna take it to public no, comment you, anyway? No, you can make a comment, sure. I, I just wanted, thank you, Mayor, I just wanted to uh, clarify with the city attorney. So when we receive a report by, from this um, company, Sober Living by the Sea, it represents uh, a number of recovery homes in the city of Newport Beach, which is fine. I'm not disputing that. I just want to clarify that there are other companies that do have similar operations in Newport Beach. And it, maybe if you could comment on that, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, just briefly. Um, so the sea entered into a, what we termed a zoning and implementation agreement with Sober Living by the Sea, which gave them certain rights under that agreement. Uh, but one of the requirements is that they come back and report every year on whether they're in compliance or not. If they're not in compliance, then uh, the city can take a look at revocation of, of that agreement. But it appears that they are in compliance um, and have done a good job uh, this year based on the report I read. There are others that don't have a zoning implementation agreement out there, um, and there's no requirement to report because they don't have the same type of rights. Okay, thank you. All right, seeing no other comments from up here, I'll open the public hearing. Are there any, anyone wish to speak on this item? Please come up. Well, since we have some people on our city council up here that are connected with Scott Baugh, who's directly connected with Sober Living by the Sea, I think somebody might wanna be paying attention to this since it's election time. Um, Mr. Baugh moved also the main offices of Sober Living by the Sea up to 1901 Newport Boulevard. And then uh, some of these homes turned into different named recovery homes. I think that the, I you know, you know, uh, they say we've got trouble right here in River City and it starts with P and it stands for pool from the music, you know, man. No, we have trouble right here in Newport Beach and Costa Mesa and it starts with C and it stands for corruption involved with sober living. It's dark, dirty money and there's people sitting up here on this dais right now that are connected with this and I wish the voters of Newport and Costa Mesa and Huntington Beach before they check any boxes at the federal, state, or local level, make sure, I know Mr. Herdman, you're clean as a whistle on this one. <laughs> no, there's people up here that are dirty on this. You're dirty. You are taking money from sober living operators via PACs, etc. And before the people of Newport Beach vote even if you if you have not already it, voted, it's, I'm a, it's appropriate. You it's appropriate out. for you Thank to criticize you. the council. Is inappropriate to campaign. I, I just want to say no. That's not true. Uh, you're wearing a Harley T-shirt. You should try to represent him better. That's completely false. No one's accepting money from rehab up here. And they say that we're dirty or corrupt. It's just that's that doesn't work well in Newport Beach. 
All right, anyone else like to speak on this? Evening, Council. My name is Alex Shugant. <clears throat> Sorry, my name is Alex Shugant, and I'm a resident living on Patrice Road with my wife and six-month-old son. Uh, we are neighbors of two sober living by the sea facilities located at the addresses of 4138 and 4142 Patrice. Uh, each of these addresses are permitted for six beds for a total of 12 patients um, at this particular house. I have had concerns regarding secondhand smoke emitting from the front patios of these facilities and fill, filling my house with smoke. Um, but I can report back that I've been in touch with the city as well as sober living by the sea and can report that my concerns were heard. Um, and we're currently working on a plan to solve these problems. It's encouraging to know that city staff and sober living by the sea are motivated to listen and work with their neighbors in Newport Beach. There is one issue pertaining to sober living by the sea that they're unable to resolve solely on their own. Uh, the issue at hand is a fundamental alteration of the local government zoning scheme, and more specifically, it's the overly intense use of land zoned as multiple residential, which, ha uh, which houses these two facilities. It might interest the council to know that these two sober living facili facilities operate on Patrice Road, occupy the same parcel of land owned by a single owner that also allows the operation of two very large short-term rentals housing up to 24 guests. While I understand that RM zoning designation allows for short-term lodging and also permits the sober living group homes, I do not believe it's the intent of the planning commission to wholly convert the RM use into a zone of for-profit businesses. RM zoning should be intended for residents, for neighbors, for families, and the occasional short-term lodging establishment or the occasional sober living facility. In my circumstance along Patrice Road, instead of having eight homes with children for my son to play with and established neighbors to befriend, I have two hotels and two medical facilities housing 36 non-permanent clients and patients. Furthermore, it is concerning to me that the overuse of multiple residential land did not occur by accident, but instead was the result of a calculated business strategy by the property owner, the Saywitz Company. The Saywitz Company is the same company that was reported by the OC Register in January of this year that faced a legal suit initiated by the city of Costa Mesa for improperly establishing three sober living facilities in their city. It appears that there are loopholes within our permitting process that businesses are taking advantage of to make money at the expense of local neighborhoods. My question to council are the following. Are there any reviews of the location of both temporary lodging permits and sober living facilities to ensure that neighborhoods are not inundated with for-profit businesses taking advantage of this loophole? Seeing that sober, and second question is seeing that sober living facilities are supporting patients overcoming addiction, do we really believe that allowing short-term rentals to operate nearby with constant weekend parties frequently involving alcohol is a healthy environment for sober living facilities? Again, let me state, I do not oppose the occasional well-managed sober living facility nor the occasional short-term lodging establishment. However, my neighborhood is drowning in these alternate non-intended uses, and I'm hopeful that council can do something about it. Thank you for your time. Mm, thank you. Anyone else? Seeing no one, I'll close the public hearing, bring it back to the council up here. Um, seeing no one wants to speak, anyone like to, is there a motion? I'll uh, move that the annual review of zoning implementation for sober living by the C report be approved. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Let's vote. And just, just to confirm, that's the full st uh, staff action, because there's actually a couple other items on that there as well. Just before we see the entire staff recommendation. So moved. Okay, thank you. Motion carries unanimously, 6 0. You ready? Okay, uh, item 13, Grand Canal Dredging Project, phase two. Would anyone like to see a staff report? Seeing none, what? Sh how about a short Dodger? Absolutely, short, I think we can do that. The Dodger uh, Good game. evening, Mayor, Council Members, the Dave Dodger Webb, Public Works Director. Short. I hear the word short, short, short. Dodger but, um, Chris Miller here is an expert in short, short. He'll be giving the report tonight, so Chris. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. This is to discuss phase two of the Grand Canal project. Um, those are some stats. It's not very long and not very wide, which makes it a challenge to dredge. Um, of course, dredging will increase depths. Uh, it'll also decrease the odor that residents have um, uh, smelled in the area due to the anaerobic sediment, and also it'll improve circulation. It's been dredged before. 50, 1953 was the first time, at least according to our records, it was dredged. Also dredged uh, in 1962, 74, 85, and these pictures down below show in 1999. And then, of course, it was the first phase, phase was dredged. First phase of this current project was dredged in 2017. In 2017, uh, we dredged about a third of the canal, and the cost was about $379,000 for about 2,100 cubic yards. For the second phase, uh, if you recall, the uh, uh, the first bid was rejected, and that was for one point, almost 1.5 million dollars. We asked the contractors why the bid, bid was high and, and two big reasons that they said that that would decrease the cost would be if the uh, daily work hours could be increased, meaning uh, more, more hours in the day than the normal construction times allowed by the city to take advantage of tides and also the limited calendar days. So we expanded the calendar days uh, and gave them a wider margin of, of time and um, more time in the day to work. So they came back and um, our bid was decreased by a little over $100,000. Another component of the project is, uh, or an additive item would be to dredge the Harbor Island Channel, which is the red circle in the upper right hand corner. Um, it's a very narrow channel and to my knowledge it hasn't been dredged at least recently fully and um, sand does migrate down primarily from the Beacon Bay Beach into that channel. It's not, not a navigable channel for large vessels by any stretch, but it's for smaller vessels, uh, electric boats, duffies, or electric boats and um, uh, runabouts and uh, Avons like, and such as that. But vessels do run aground. So options that the city council might have would be to award uh, award the grant uh, the um, the project as stated in the staff report, of course, or award just the Grand Canal dredging only, or reject all bids, or maybe rebid later. But some, some notes of caution is that there aren't very many companies around who um, do dredging, and particularly in the small market. So the competition is is few, and mobilization rates are always high. Other considerations the council might take is that um, the, the tides to do this type of job frequently or, or primarily occur during the months between October and February because they're higher tides during daylight hours as opposed to higher tides during nighttime hours. It's a narrow channel, requires careful barge management and um, control. And uh, we, are, we, we are looking at alternate cost-effective options for for dredging uh, in the main channels, but those do uh, have permitting challenges unto themselves, and we just don't know what would happen, so there's a little bit of an unknown there. And that's all that I have, whoops, that's all that I have, and happy to answer any questions. So yes, thank you, Chris, and just for clarification, your recommendations tonight are either to award this project, we recognize some challenges with it, or you could reject the bids, that's item C, and give us direction on that. All right, thank you. I see that uh, Councilman Avery would like to speak on this item. Uh, Chris, uh, could you just relay what the, uh, can, can boats transit the canal? Um, yes, but it's primarily used by vessels that are uh, um, onshore moorings uh, in, in the harbor, or in the Grand Canal. Right. Um, but it's open to paddle boarders and people to in small boats. That that is correct. Um, mm -hmm. It it is closed during um, the summer months. Um, it's a channel closed May to October. And why is that? Um, well, because there's many people who use the channel other than boaters, and maybe there's people, and it's such a narrow channel. It, it's in our code, so mm -hmm. I, I don't know the origin of how it was adopted yeah. decades ago. So, and then what are the, and, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, I, and the only reason I'm commenting on this is it's just, I think to the uninitiated, it, uh, uh, 
it's a lot of money for a pretty small channel that you know could you know exist with a foot of water in it i suppose but there must be some environmental reasons or health reasons or is it just to maintain the beaches the seawall well um as you, cer certainly um you don't need to have your engine all the way down if you want to traverse the grand canal you can always um you know, lift it up a little bit to get through. If you're a hand uh, launch vessel, you can paddle. Uh, but also, the residents in the neighborhood have complained that at low tides, that there is an odor that comes from the uh, material that's primarily in the center, which doesn't get a lot of oxygen. So the theory is that we could take that center material out. Um, and also water circulation. Those would be the three benefits. Yep, thank you. All right, thank you, Mrs. Dixon. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So, if an option is we don't do anything, what happens? And that just the water, the sediment continues to rise, and the water level continues to decline. Sure. Um, there's there's nothing that says that this project is critically urgent uh, this year. Um, it the council has the option to uh, postpone, and um, I don't think uh, I don't think the world would end in the Grand Canal this year. But it's probably something we should keep on our radar for the next couple of years. Well, is your thought that we'd get a better bid in a couple of years, or it's going to be more expensive, or there'd be more competition, or competitive, or companies that are more are capable of doing this? There's only one company that does all the dredging. Well, We've got there, a monopoly. There's actually two companies that um, two companies that are in our harbor right now who do small dredging projects, and they partnered on this project utilizing their strengths one has a good tug uh, tugboat and the other has the dredging capabilities um, as to your question um, uh, is the competition um, would would I predict the competition better in future years that's hard to say but the market for dredging companies is pretty small so my hunch is that it probably wouldn't improve too much. So let me just follow up on something you said. So there are two companies out there now, so they would be participating in this project and working together, is that yeah. it? Yes. And then you mentioned about extending the hours of operation. What would that look like? Um, Day, would, a, daytime work hours. Daytime work hours, um, post uh, after 6 a.m. and up to 9, 9 p.m., maybe 10 p.m. Ha have you talked to the residents about this? No, but no, not specifically on this point. However, uh, throughout the harbor, it is common practice that we do allow dredging to occur beyond normal work hours. So okay. um, in the harbor world, going uh, allowing this, it wouldn't be um, above and beyond uh, normal. So it would be a noise impact at 6 a.m.? Is it the pounding or? The no, there wouldn't be any pounding. In this particular case, they would be using an excavator on top of a barge. So yes, there'd be machinery working, but it wouldn't be pound, pound, pound. Um, I, I wouldn't characterize it as being quiet, but uh, it certainly wouldn't be as noisy as, as, you, as you might be thinking. And Councilmember Dixon, it's probably good to emphasize that that's one of the ways we can get the price down because, as, as Chris mentioned, dredging this canal is all tidal dependent. You can only get in when the tide's in there, so they get two cycles a day. So if we get them a wider window, that gives them more work time, which brings the cost down and actually speeds up the project. Speeds up the project. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? My quick comment would be the other the Harbor Island Bridge is not is getting further and further. <clears throat> yeah, not navigable. So um, if we can get that taken care of along at the same time, it would be very beneficial. So it's not just that one canal. So I'd like to now open to this to the public. Anyone wish to come up and speak on this item? Uh, Mayor Duffield, members of the council, my name is Jim Mosier. Uh, I was just trying to understand the comment we just heard about the the um, award you're asking, being asked to approve, actually being a cooperative agreement between two companies, because the staff report says to award a contract to Associated Pacific Contractors, if I'm reading it correctly, and on the inside page it says that there were two bidders who had close, but uh, Associated Pacific was a little lower than Bosco contractors. Are we talking about those two people that bid are now? 
working together so that their bids were kind of coordinated with each other? Or are there two other companies that are operating under the name Associated Pacific Contract Constructors, and that is who the council is being asked to award the contract to? It's kind of unusual when you have a competition between two bidders and then the result is some combination of the two because the staff report doesn't mention that at all. Thank you. All right, thank you. Anyone else? Seeing none, can you uh, maybe chime in on Mr. Moser's question? Yes, I can. Um, the sub, uh, Associated Pacific has listed a subcontractor, which is Pacific Tug. That's the other company that's doing work in Newport Beach. Uh, the other contractor listed who is a responding bidder um, is not who I was referring to in my earlier comment. They are totally separate bidder. Okay. Bring it. <clears throat> Seeing no other people would like to speak on this, I'll close the public comments and bring it back. And don't see anyone, any comments up here. So is there a motion? Yes, I'll move. Uh, <clears throat> well, we have three options here. So I will move uh, the approval of the project drawings and specifications and the award of a contract uh, for Grand Canal dredging and Harbor Island Bridge dredging. I'll second. All right, let's vote. <laughs> And I'm assuming you're moving item A as well, which is the the CEQA finding. So <laughs> A and B. Yes. The motion carries unanimously, 6-0. All right, moving on to the last item, number 14, approval and award of agreement for citywide refuse container collection services with CRNR. Would the council like a staff report okay we will go out to the uh, then I'd like to then go out. I don't see any comments up here so I'll go to the public would anyone out in the public like to come up and speak please come up hi my name is Murphy McCann um, I'd like to summarize and just say that CRNR should absolutely not be hired to haul more refuse for the city of Newport Beach. They have a horrible, horrible safety record. Since they killed my kid uh, over two years ago, I have tried many times and have found them non-responsive to improving their operations around school. They operate near schools at pick up and drop off times. They run stop signs and they're on cell phones while they're operating their trash trucks around the neighborhood. These, this contract, from what I understand, is uh, related to picking up trash uh, in beaches, around beaches and piers. Um, these are high pedestrian traffic areas. Um, and these, uh, some of the, some of the you know, people that we're talking about are uh, the Newport Beach Junior Guards uh, that have their home base down at the Balboa Pier. Um, I've repeatedly seen trucks driving around the Balboa Pier in the mornings right when Junior Guards starts in the morning. They are not sensitive at all to any of the child traffic issues around this city. I would go further to say that actually they should not be allowed to bid on any more Newport Beach City contracts because of their performance uh, to date. The, there's a separate point to this, which the council members Duffy, Muldoon, O'Neill, and Piotr have all recently received, uh, potentially unsolicited, but nonetheless they've received campaign contributions from CRNR directly uh, within the last, I, I'm, I may misquote this, but within the last couple of months. Um, I think that they should recuse themselves uh, from potential conflicts of interest related to uh, this contract and any campaign finance issues. Um, to that point, uh, Ms. Dixon, I really very much appreciate your returning their contribution to your campaign. Um, my last point on this is that I think the, the bid results, uh, the other bidders, who they were, how much they bid, ought to be made public so that we could have a further review uh, of exactly what's going on with this fairly large contract. Uh, I see here there's uh, amounts here totaling over 
$3 million over seven years. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, any other speakers? Uh, Mayor Duffield, members of the council, my name again is Jim Mosier. Um, uh, the, the service of emptying the miscellaneous trash cans around the city, which incidentally apparently does not involve the ones that are in the parks, these are miscellaneous ones along the streets, uh, is a service that I believe was formerly conducted by city staff itself, who, as Mr. McCann said, perhaps could be trusted to be more responsible. <clears throat> uh, it appears that in 2012, we went with the Roberts Company at a rate of $250,000 a year. All the bids you have are much, much higher than that per year. I think the council should ask if staff did any evaluation now because rules about prevailing wage and so forth, which might have been a reason uh, for going to a private company or vendor to do this previously in-house service, should be reconsidered. They now have to pay the prevailing wage, giving much higher amounts here. And the city now has the opportunity to hire what are called the PEPRA employees at a lower rate. Uh, so, uh, and, and especially some of these are just fantastically higher. One. One, going from $250,000, the WARE proposal, $1.5 million per year for doing the same thing. Um, I think you do not have to ask the question whether the city staff could do it. Um, regarding the question of campaign contributions, I, I have a similar concern. The city now to their credit, has, has made available to the public a statements of in, economic in, statement of economic in, impact that, that you all have to file the Form 700. And uh, I am really surprised to see that our city employees never report any gifts or anything that they receive from these potential contractors. And I'm wondering if they really never are taken out to lunch by the people who might be doing these things. The, the report, reporting contract threshold is very low, like $50. In it. Anyway, I find that surprising. And then finally, I think we need to add some trash cans. The, the staff report has a map here. And some of the trash cans are at bus stops. And when you have a bus stop with no trash can, you have a real problem. People have nowhere to dispose of their trash. Uh, I come here usually and go back by bicycle. A couple of years ago, the Orange County Transit Authority, when they were streamlining their bus routes, they, they left the bus stop and trash can that is by the Newport, um, Newport Beach Country Club. <coughs> But they eliminated the one that's near Bayside Drive and the one that's on Dover Drive. The shelter is taken away. The trash cans are taken away. The city really needs to be proactive and put trash cans at those bus stops because they are still bus stops and people congregate there. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Anyone else? I'll bring it back. Um, so <clears throat> that was a pretty powerful testimony. Um, it's taken me aback. Um, we have two uh, council people that would like to speak on this. Um, Mr. Avery. Yeah, that was, um, it's powerful testimony and it, um, it was an event that um, is still reverberating um, through the community. And um, I also know um, that you know, I think uh, DNR took this incident very seriously. Um, and I guess I would uh, maybe like to at least, my preference maybe to take a look at this in terms of their record, numbers of complaints, that kind of thing against other trash companies, if there's an anomaly there, if we're, um, there's something there. I'm not sure how fast we could do that, but. Um. 
Um, I would just like to get a little cold comfort that um, I, I think a tragedy like this um, shouldn't necessarily um, exclude a firm that I think enjoyed a, a pretty good reputation up until the time of the uh, tragedy. And um, so I think uh, at some point we, uh, we need to look and just see what the numbers are since then um, in terms of any complaints and uh, what the log shows. I know there's been some, but I assume that's not just, to, you know, I think there's a lot of moving parts in this city. There's a lot of trucks driving around, uh, trash trucks and otherwise. It's just plain dangerous out there as far as I'm concerned. It's just like any community, but ours is a real tight community. Um, things are going to happen. People are going to make mistakes. But I think uh, I would like to just know that if we're going to approve this, that there's not something here that we're missing in terms of the um, uh, allegations that are made here tonight. Uh, thank you, Councilman Avery. I can't speak directly to Mr. McCain's concerns because I know there's an ongoing lawsuit to that. I do have Keith Hankley, our refuge coordinator here. He's been working with CRNR a long time. We do have positive results from the company. Uh, this is a different type of service. These trucks are much smaller. They're not the big uh, front loaders. They're a smaller vehicle, so obviously the clearances and, and um, backing and things is a little different animal. I'll have Keith talk to that. And if you'd like two representatives from CRNR here tonight, who could talk about their company safety and why they're best qualified for that. Um, Dean Ruffridge is up there and Jeff Snow, their recent new vice president, might want to talk to that issue too. But why don't I turn to Keith. Keith, could you give us a little background on your feelings of the um, safety aspects and complaints, as Mr. Avery mentioned, might have a, uh, some comfort level of what you feel and how many complaints uh, compared to what relative other providers have had? Good evening. Since the accident just over two years ago, we have gotten the community much more involved in what's going on with all of our refuse haulers, not only CRNR. The neighborhood that was most heavily affected has been very vocal, calling in when there's a perceived issue up there. Uh, more often than not, the complaints have just come in, it's a trash truck and it's been identified erroneously as CRNR, not that there have not been some issues involved with them. Um, one of the things that's been implemented is the change of times when they can operate within the school zone areas, particularly up in that area. Um, there were some issues with a number of the haulers at the time violating that time frame. This is something that has also come in under our new franchise hauler agreement that went into effect in the fall of 2017. Uh, we ha I personally am the one who generally takes the complaints. Um, where they go through the city manager's office or they come to me directly, and I've been working with CRNR and also identifying whether it's CRNR or another company that's been involved. We did have some other companies that were misidentified. They've been addressed as have the issues with the collection times up in that neighborhood during the school zone drop off and pickup times. Um, CRNR has devoted a lot of energies to correcting the problems and making sure that there are you know, much more safer conditions out there. They have been very cooperative with me when I've identified issues or issues have been passed along to me following up on them. Um, as um, Mr. Webb has mentioned, that we have representatives from that company that can speak to the efforts on their end. Um, I don't find that their complaints have increased, nor have there been anything significant since that time. Um, that obviously was a tragedy. It was also an abnormality in all of our haulers. I monitor all of them for their activities in the city, uh, ensuring that they are operating safely. There are five commercial haulers, and we have 34 other haulers that provide dumpster service and other haulaway services. Um, all of them function up in that neighborhood where the accident took place, but we have implemented these same restrictions on all of them. Obviously, the biggest concern is the commercial haulers that are moving through that area because it's on the edge of Costa Mesa and Newport, but it really doesn't matter if they're in our town. They should be franchised to function here. Um, at the same time, I'm working with the uh, haulers that are bringing dumpsters in. They're prohibited from operating up in the school zone during the time. And I might mention, too, that I, in a 
this is a tragic event, but we do haul a lot of refuge on different contracts. So you're aware we have a Republic contract, a separate contract on our beach that hauls. We have the Roberts contract that hauls. So we have various operators and we have a pretty good safety record on those operations in the beach in the peninsula area. And this is, this is particularly that area and on Coast Highway where we do the most of the uh, bus pickups. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I'd, I'd invite the representative of CRNR to come down if you'd like to speak to that issue or if the council would like any more information. Are you done, Mr. Avery? Um, well, I think we should have as much information as we can get tonight, if possible. Thank you, Ms. Mrs. Dixon. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Well, to follow up on that line of questioning, since the tragedy two years ago, could you define what we are now requiring differently of any hauler anywhere in the city, particularly in areas where there are parks or, or schools that where children are? heavy pedestrian areas. What are we doing differently today? One of the things that came out approximately a year after the accident was that the haulers were prohibited from operating within 500 feet of the school zones, government areas, uh, high traffic areas such as the parks during the particular drop off times in the morning from 7.30 to 9 and in the afternoon from 1.30 to 3, keeping them away from the schools during that time, trying to minimize the contact between large vehicles and pedestrians and bicyclists. Now, how do we enforce that? Number of ways. I monitor what the haulers are doing in the areas during the collection days. I'm out in the field looking at various areas. The residents are very aware of what's going on. I get a fair number of uh, phone calls from people inquiring when are they supposed to be here, why are they here, also as to the distance away of the, from the schools. Um, these calls have decreased significantly over the last year, year and a half. Um, they were pretty active around the time that this was implemented. The haulers have been very responsive and, and have, as a result, stayed out of these areas. Um, there are penalties that will be employed against them if they do violate. What are, what are the penalties? It can, it can go from financial up to the loss of the franchise hauler agreement. Have we issued any penalties in the last two years to any hauler? I'm not aware of it. I've been working with the companies when we would get the complaints. As Mr. Webb mentioned, there are a number of haulers that function up there. Um, some are with the city, some are outside of the city. Even, the, the, for example, CRNR who collects in the city, they collect next door and occasionally their vehicles will come in on that corner of the town and turn around or do the one street over. But I've worked with CRNR's area managers to ensure that they are holding their drivers in our neighboring cities uh, to the same level of accountability. So in this area that we're going to be designating for the short haulers and the beaches, beach areas, have we overlaid the areas where there are schools and parks? Have we imposed that restriction similarly as we've done up in Newport Heights? These areas have been identified in the franchise hauler agreements, including the elementary schools down there. Yes. They have. Um, Mr. Webb mentioned Roberts. Are we still working with Roberts in other parts of the city then? Robert still maintains the current uh, CAN contract with us, the container contract, um, which expires at the end of this year, December. They've agreed to go two more months in order to allow right. CRNR to phase in. And then they would no longer be servicing the city? Not in this capacity. Okay. And if it is appropriate, I would like to hear from the representatives of CRNR at some point this evening. Thank you. Mr. Muldoon. Uh, thank you. Uh, first off, um, to Mr. McCann, there are, there are no words, and I can't even pretend to address your concerns. Um, just for the sake of, um, of appearance for those who are watching, uh, Mr. Hinckley, were you overseeing this RFP process? I was involved in it, yes. Have I contacted you about this or discussed with you at all? No, you have not. Mr. Webb, have I contacted you about this or discussed with you at all? I have not had no contact with you. So this, the staff report was brought to us uh, through the RFP process, and um, there's no undue influence um, in how this came to us, or quite frankly, why it was even chosen. The parameters are set by staff, and I've had no communications with staff about this, or lobbyists for that matter. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, for a point of order, is, am I allowed to do this? And for, I closed the public hearing. Yeah, so. you, you can bring up representatives from the company if, they're, if they'd like to come up and speak or ask them questions. All right. Could we please uh, get a representative? Is there one here? <coughs> Thank you.
Good evening, honorable mayor and council members. I'm Jeff Snow with CRNR Environmental Services. In regard to safety, our company has never, ever taken anything more seriously than the incident that occurred. The incident shook the city, it shook the county, it shook the industry. Our company has always had a great focus on safety. It's a dangerous industry, fourth most dangerous in the U.S. Ongoing litigation precludes any specific comments, but I assure you we've never taken anything, I've never taken anything more seriously. Overall, CRNR has an experiential modification factor, which is the way that safety is measured. The industry standard is one or 100. Our two 2017 experiential modification factor was 63, making us the safest operating hauler in Orange County. We devote and dedicate several human resources to our safety management and our entire team from the executive level to the driver level meets on regularly scheduled basis to discuss near misses, any incidents, to learn from the root cause of those, and safety is a priority and the most important thing at CRNR every day. We are deeply committed to operating in the safe way in all the communities in which we serve. Thank you. Anyone have any questions? Nope. All right, thank you. This is a hard one. All right, I'll bring it back. I see no other comments up here. Is there a motion? Question? Sure. Um, Mr. Avery, were you asking before we vote or before we incorporate this information that you were asking staff? in terms of the safety record and that type of thing? Well, from what I hear that there's, um, and I know we're, it's difficult to uh, deal with this, uh, there's nothing outstanding in terms of complaints in the past year, or, or can you answer that? Don't need to, don't have to, if you're precluded by uh, litigation. I don't have any ongoing complaints at this time that have yet to be followed up on. Mm -hmm. Anything that came in in the past was addressed and determined whether it was a valid complaint or an erroneous complaint, following, and I followed up with the appropriate company if that were the case. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, there were a number of times that the residents would call or email me in regards to the location of a truck, even with a photo of it. Um, quite a few times, the truck was outside of that 500 feet zone. Uh, I've worked with their area manager and their supervisor to ensure that their drivers are very familiar with this and that they do stay out of those zones and that they are familiar where the boundaries are. And they have committed to staying out of that area even a longer period so as not to be involved in it. I'm aware of your work and, and overall the city's diligence in, in this matter. Um, this does not preclude, for instance, uh, cement trucks entering the neighborhood, correct? Uh, the preclusion time. you talked to just dealt with our franchise haulers. Uh, right. we, we don't have any ability to regulate or uh, preclude UPS trucks, franchise trucks, interstate commerce trucks that go through moving vans. Right. Um, yeah, and that's being a resident of the Heights, and well, I, I don't think the Heights is special in this regard, but in our city recently with what's been going on, you know, the amount of Delivery trucks and construction trucks and cement trucks is, is just really something. It's, it's a miracle to me we haven't had more accidents. I mean, it's just the sheer volume of human beings and vehicles in very confined, tough spaces, large trucks, small kids. It's, it's really scary. And uh, I think we have people that most of the time, the vast majority of the time, are being careful. And this is a real tough one. But I... I don't believe CRNR is an evil company. I don't believe that they are um, um, in any way uh, reckless. Um, I've never felt that before. Um, I understand uh, Mr. McCann's, no I don't frankly, because I can't. I, 
I can't certainly speak for him or talk to, about his uh, what's going on in his life because of this uh, tragedy. But on the other side of it, um, I think we have in general and perhaps CNR, I know, has enjoyed a pretty good reputation um, before this and uh, I know is very concerned to move forward in a responsible way, um, just as any first-rate company would be, and they are, um, I think, uh, a very good company, along with the rest of our haulers. I think, you know, we're pretty careful about who we select in this town. Our residents demand it. So um, I'm, uh, I'm going to support this uh, and vote if... Uh, to uh, allow this to go forward. Thank you. Dixon. And a motion? Has anybody motion? May I make a friendly amendment to your motion? Could we have on an ongoing basis, and maybe this should apply to all haulers, uh, do we have ongoing quarterly or semi-annual reports on safety, complaints that are received, how they were are handled, disposed of? I have no... I believe what you're telling us, certainly, but I think we should quantify the data about customer complaints and safety issues for any company. I'm not singling out CRNR, any franchise hauler that serves in the city of Newport Beach. I would like to amend your motion that we would begin to apply that in this case. Maybe we could do that separately as opposed to tying it to the specific contract, just bring that back as a separate item. So you'd bring that back at another council meeting, or tonight? Apologize, I didn't hear the question. Oh, so you're proposing to bring this back? No, no, no. Tonight, I, I'm proposing or? just to keep it as separate from I mean, this item, as opposed to tying it to it. Um, that's something staff just can do as a part of you know annual reporting or quarterly reporting, if you want, however often you want. So maybe it's something we t discuss um, offline and not tied to this particular contract. I just want to make sure it happens. Yeah. Okay. okay. You comfortable with that? I, as long as the office makes it happen. <laughs> it's a process and procedure. It's more of kind of like a, you know, A1 type of item as opposed to, you know, tying it to this particular motion. You can tie it to this motion if you want. That's, that's fine. Seriously, we had a tragedy in our yeah. community. I, I know we're doing a lot of things to improve the performance of our franchise haulers. I, I've not seen a single report on safety. I see the letters that come in and complaints, and I see that they're resolved or addressed, and sometimes they are outside the 500-foot limit and that type of thing. But I think we owe it to our community that we are monitoring the safety of our franchise haulers, and I would like to codify that requirement. And if Mr. Avery would agree to adding that to this, and we could begin this process, and staff can fill this out in whatever procedure way, that when we when we consider franchise contracts, that we understand in a formal way their safety record. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I, I was I was getting too technical. I didn't, you know, that's not really on the agenda, so I'm just getting too technical about it. So it, it's fine to include. So if great, that's so I include that. Thank you. All right, good. So we have a motion and a second, and um, let's vote. Councilmember Dixon, did you second the motion? Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. With Councilmember Herdman voting no, the motion carries 5 1. Well, Madam Clerk. Now it's time for motion for reconsideration. A motion to reconsider the vote on any action taken by the city council at either this meeting or the previous meeting may be made only by one of the council members who voted with the prevailing side. Are there any motions for reconsideration? Seeing none, we are adjourned.